All right, welcome to season four, episode four of the ESG Experience, the podcast about all things ESG and beyond. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes into the universe, this podcast could be for you. Together, we'll navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, share strategies, and discuss industry news and trends. I'm Ryan Nelson, the SVP and General Manager of ESG at Conservice. Today, we are joined by Larry Dorfman, co-founder and managing partner of Roots, to discuss the role of real estate investment in the community, understanding the science behind investing, and how anyone can build wealth, real wealth, by investing in real estate with the help of Roots. Welcome, Larry. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, yes. Larry is the co-founder uh, of Roots, which we talked about before getting into real estate. Larry spent 35 years as the co-founder and chairman slash CEO of APCO Holdings, an organization best known for its strong brands, including Easy Care, GWC Warranty, CoVideo, and Motor Trend certified vehicles. And something that uh, Larry mentioned he's very proud of is that he sits on many company boards, including Because I Said I Would, and also Hope through soap. So again, hello, Larry. I believe you said you're in Atlanta. Welcome. And tell us a little bit about because I said I would and hope through soap. Well, they are. Um, thanks for asking about those because I love to talk about them whenever I get a chance to. Um, because I said I would is a is a charity.org run by Alex Sheen. In 2015, my oldest son sent me a video of this guy doing a TED talk about superheroes. And I thought, okay, that's funny. And I watched it and and it was an incredible uh, 15 minutes of, of this young man talking about making and keeping promises and why superheroes become the heroes and why the villains are villains. And typically um, the reason they become superheroes is there's a moment that changed their lives and then they become, you know, a force for good. And um, what what Alex Sheen does he, better than anybody I've ever seen is he teaches young people how to make and keep promises. And those include that I won't cut my wrist and I won't overdose on drugs and I'll do well in school. And uh, he has built one heck of a nonprofit uh, out speaking for truly thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 per speech at schools, universities, big companies. And uh, he takes less money off that than anybody I've ever seen. He takes a well under $100,000 salary to run this massive multi-million dollar charity and deliver that experience to people. Yeah, that's that. That is, uh, you got me really inspired with that. That's great. I know the value of, um, you know, like creating accountability by saying, doing something or saying something and then doing it. And then this is even deeper than that. Uh, you, you're talking about making promises to yourself that are very important things for your own health and well being. And then to be able to live a fulfilling life, it sounds like to be able to say things like that, which um, I, I can see is. A very important thing to be able to do, but maybe a lot of people haven't been inspired to do it or haven't had the kind of mentors to to show them how to do it. It's not easy. I mean, we all think we're promise keepers. Go into a group of any number of people you want to and ask them if they are people who keep their word and they'll raise their hand. Yeah. And ask them how many of them told somebody they'd do something like bring the laundry home from the dry cleaner that afternoon, but didn't make it or didn't get home on time. And, and when I watched, yeah, when I watched, um, this thing the first time I really, what I really broke it down to Ryan was three different kinds of accountability, you know, in organizations and ours, it was about 560 people. Um, we didn't believe in top down accountability. We actually had an inverted org chart that operated with C level team down on the bottom, looking up at our people, not down on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that supporting them upstream was a way to get the most and empowering them to do the things they do because they're touching the customer much more often than, than the C-suite was right. And um, and so not believing in that kind of top-down accountability, I've always believed peer-to-peer -peer was a better a better force. People sitting next to each other and being accountable. I watched uh, Alex and I listened to him and I learned right then that it's personal accountability that makes all the difference. That's the most powerful. And I've been wearing a bracelet that says "Because I said I would" since 2015, and basically only comes off when somebody says, "What's that?" And I go, "Here, you want one?" And they go, "Yeah," and they take it. And um, it, it's about promising less to make sure you can accomplish more. So, so everybody over promises and under delivers, be accountable. And so he's teaching these young people, they fill out promise cards about what they're gonna do and they give it to you. They give it to their parents, they give it to their teachers. Mm. 
and they get them back after they do what they said they would. Wow. It's really, really cool stuff. Hope through soap was the other one you asked about in uh I found them interestingly around the same time, maybe a year or two later in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was just two people running around with a, a shower unit, clothes and some food, and um just going right out to the homeless community and saying, Hey, we can't fix you, but we can make today better than yesterday for you. How long has it been since you had a shower? And they'd be like <laughs> three months. And um that started there when I met him. I think we had a budget of about eighty thousand dollars a year that was being raised. Now it's well over a million. And um, you know, it's a three shower unit, and they're they're doing three events a week. And they also now are focused not just on the homeless um, and have, having them have our friends in the street having a better day than they had the day before, but on thirteen to twenty two year olds who have experienced homelessness and who want to get out of it. They're not so ingrained in it that they don't know how, nor right. is even choosing to get out, if that's even fair to say, but they want to get out of it. And so we've got about 90 youth in that program now in less than a year and a half. And we're helping them evolve through learning and through uh, getting them homes and places they can actually live in and then transitioning fully. So it's uh, been quite an experience. Yeah, that's also incredible, Larry. You're making me feel like uh, I don't do enough here. Um, this is amazing. But I, I, people, myself specifically, sometimes get frozen. Like I, I think, okay, I want to solve the problem, like homelessness, you know, or really move the needle. And you, and then you kind of get stuck. Like, well, what's the point of helping that person out or handing them, you know, something? Because that doesn't, what's that going to do? And you get stuck. And I and I do try to make more of that effort. Well, let's make today something a little bit better. Or even if it's fleeting, at least it's you know, let's do that and not get frozen until you solve the whole thing. You gotta gotta get some movement going one way or another. So yeah, that that's a really cool story too. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually um, when my son Daniel came to me with his friend Scott and talked to me about roots. Um, hope through soap was a catalyst into the roots piece for me because having spent this many years in the street almost every saturday and as we were continued to grow i was getting really super frustrated you know you feel good out there for two three hours you're helping people out they're getting their hair cut they're getting fresh and you go back to your really nice home and they go back onto the bridge yeah and um and i was getting frustrated and i i truly was one of those people who would throw five dollars at somebody and keep moving right and um and megan uh, the woman who is the executive director of Hope Through Soap really taught me how to talk to people and how to how to connect with them in the street at a different level. And the more I did, the more I realized that so many were already done. They they had already accepted this fate. And um, when Daniel and and um, and Scott came to me and and they were talking about this idea of democratizing real estate in a way that anybody can invest and build wealth and everything else, I kept saying, "That's great, guys, y'all." Go do it. That sounds like a great idea. If you ask me for advice, happy to give you the advice. <clears throat> Until they hit on the resident, on the person who actually pays the rent. And the concept that location, location, location might not be all there is to be talked about in real estate. Because the truth is the best located property in the world with nobody living in it paying rent does not make money. And um, they indicated, you know, their feelings were that we could engage residents. We do not call them tenants. Tenants should live in a tenement. And uh, we are not landlords because that's a medieval term from Lord of the Land. And that's why they don't even have master bedrooms in houses anymore, right? It's the primary mm -hmm. bedroom. Right. Um, and so it's appropriate. And we just, we, we're changing language and we're changing, uh, shifting literally a paradigm shift in the relationship between property owners and their residents by letting the residents actually build wealth while they live there and the catalyst to that was the one piece of information i found when i started researching it 66 million renting americans 66 million there will be 70 soon because nobody buying a house right now mm -hmm. um, there's not already in one the average savings account you want to take a stab at it what you think their average savings account is uh i will take a stab average savings account of the 66 million renters, I'm going to go with uh, 1,200 bucks. Under 650. And then 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in the bank. So when they 
when they were bringing this up to me, I started doing my own research to see. I was in, I was retired and stepped down out of Africa already and having a really good quiet time during the pandemic, to be honest. Uh, spending time with grandchildren, um, trying to figure out if I, what if I was going to do next, and other than just maybe just do charitable work. And um, and it occurred to me that if you have only six hundred fifty dollars in the bank with an average rent of thirteen fourteen hundred dollars, you are fr you are fringe homeless as it is. And that. Had there not been two and a half, almost three trillion dollars put out there during the pandemic, which needed to be right, but it can't always be, mm -mm. then we would have had a lot more homeless folks out on the street. In fact, all those rental abatements, all of those, all those really good things that got passed that are going away now, right? People are going to have to pay their student loans and all these other things. They're going to create a lot more problems. Uh, the short of a shortage of workforce housing is is incredible. So when you look at that and realize most people that rent anything are just a paycheck away or one instance away from really not having enough money to pay the rent or a car payment or anything else. So when they came to me and said, hey, what if we had the resident and instead of them putting that security deposit in that they basically know they're never going to get back <laughs> because about 81% of them never do get any of it back. Really? Yes. Um, when when a security deposit, well, let me let me give this as an example. Provision now put out the numbers about the under six hundred and fifty dollars worth of savings. Had they considered the security deposit savings, it would have been closer to two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But they don't, because think about the adversarial relationship between the resident and the property owner or the property manager. And what they saw was an ability to change that to an advocacy, to a relationship that could be positive, that could actually create a different situation for that resident. And what we've happened to do since July of 2021, we started housing people in uh, March of 21. But since July of 21, we raised a little bit right at about $16 million. We've got almost $20 million worth of uh, property under management. And the residents in those properties now have average savings accounts of almost three thousand dollars wow that's a significant difference and the way we did it is we just we, we formulated a regulation a company got approved by the sec so that anyone can invest as well as a hundred dollars and be invested more important the resident could actually invest what would have been a security deposit they'd never see and they can watch it grow every quarter along with everybody else who's invested in the fund does that make sense yeah, it does. Um, I really want to want to dive in and make sure that I understand it so that everyone can understand it. Uh, but you've hit me with, with so much already. It's amazing. I, of course, was, you know, there's a bit of a cynical concern um, when it comes to ESG and impact investing and setting these things up. I can tell you from however long I've been talking now, I feel like that cynicism is washed away it sounds extremely sincere uh and incredible um but yeah so let's really make sure i understand how it works because i i pay some attention to this stuff and i, I somewhat understand it but i, I really want to get it so re a resident and i and i love the fact that I, I haven't gotten rid of landlord yet but i but i will out of my vocabulary so <laughs> i i've you know some of them it. still qualify as landlords ryan let me just uh, say I hear you. Okay, so I just got to use it properly, but yeah. not with not with your team. But yeah, I've gotten rid of you know master bedroom and even white glove, and um, I'm trying to pay attention to those things. But landlord, I hadn't thought of that. But resident, we definitely use that word. So a resident is going to invest, and but that's that's into to the same your like the property they live in, or not necessarily, or it's a well, fund. That's, a, that that's might, a great question. Probably the most confusing one for most people. So Roots okay. Real Estate Investment Community one and it's one because we have five set up that we will implement as we move along is a privately held REIT real estate investment trust mm -hmm. um very common form of investment it's a it's tax advantaged etc cetera, etc cetera. um most of them though have high fees to get in management fees waterfalls where the general partner makes a bunch of money and then exit fees if you try to get out early and you usually got to stay three to seven years we couldn't build something like that that would be democratized that would allow anybody to get in so we went and um and we were told by everybody do not 
do not try to do this. Do not try to get a regulation A, reg A fund qualification from the SEC. It'll take eight to 18 months, half a million bucks. And, um, and you gotta, it's just so hard to manage it and the compliance that you have to be under. Um, and, what, and you're gonna tell us what the reg A is, is that how you can avoid having to be a, an accredited investor? Or? Yes, yes, okay. exactly. So there are a few others, arrived homes and a few others out there that you don't have to be an accredited investor to invest. And that was the point because none of our residents are gonna be accredited. And you know, if you're accredited investors for everybody out there, if you don't know, it's two hundred thousand dollars a year as an individual and in income, three hundred as three hundred thousand as a couple, or a million dollars in net worth outside of your primary residence. That is ninety nine. That is ninety one percent of Americans do not qualify. <laughs> yeah, Larry, when I first really understood accredited investor and got in a position, you know, or I was looking at things and couldn't participate in and stuff, I was like. Well, that's really when it hit me that perhaps the system is designed purposely or not, you know, for kind of the rich keep getting richer kind of thing. I was like, but these are the best opportunities, but yeah, yes, you exactly. can't get into them unless you've already somehow created some wealth. But how can you create the wealth if you can't get into the opportunities? You know, like we let a few people come up once in a while, I guess, to tell the story or I don't know. That's when I really started going down the cynical story of, of, how this is work, I can't, works. Right I can't there. agree with you more than that. I mean, I will tell you that when when 91% of Americans are not accredited and 90 plus percent of the investments need accreditation, then it sort of tells you otherwise you can go into equities. Okay, there's 23 million people on Robinhood. Fantastic platform, excellent access who know nothing about equities and should most of them not be investing in them. Let's be real. Um, but they saw an opportunity. That's fine. Uh, they don't have to have a broker. They can get in there and if they can yeah. pick them, Good for them because they're better than me, um, you know. But when we looked at it, uh, the number one wealth building asset ever in history is real estate. Period. I don't know anybody that will argue with that, and it's only accessible to folks with a lot of money. Now, what's smart about that? Now, for in the ten years prior to 08 and nine, which we all know what happened, they were giving houses away, lowering interest rates. Uh, taking five percent from people who didn't have another three dollars to fix the place after they got it bought, and that's just setting itself up for failure. So our whole objective was, how can somebody own an entire portfolio of real estate for one hundred dollars? So basically, we right now have fifty-three properties in the Roots Real Estate Investment Community uh, LLC, and we are adding another fifty-five of them in the next three to four months, where that are being prepared. And here's what we do. We we buy them, fix them up, optimize them, rent them to people, great human beings who are ready to live in them like they own it. We call it living it like you own it. We teach them this process, which is if you'll pay your rent on time, if you every single month and you'll be a good neighbor, that means basically workforce housing, don't have the police called, you know, don't make so much noise that the neighbors complaining about you. Some of these houses are single family, some are duplexes, quads, and we have one 10 unit. We want to be a multifamily, but the institutions, including some who call themselves ESG, have blown the cost of that up so much that it's not affordable housing. You can't, it's not, it doesn't work. Um, but if they'll pay their rent, be a good neighbor, and walk once a quarter through the property and do a quick video for us. Mm. And here's what we need you to do. Just look for these things. We teach them. Look for under the sinks, make sure there's no leaks. You see a dark spot up in the bathroom, let us know because that could be a hundred dollar water leak now. That'll be a five thousand dollar mold abatement problem in a few years. Be our partner, live in it like you own it. You do own a piece of this and all the other properties in the fund. So it's not a rent to own, it is an own while you rent. The moment you move in and that money is invested, you are an owner of the whole portfolio at the exact same level as I am or anyone else who's invested. You make the same proportional income, you pay the, the same zero fees in, the same zero fees if you wanna exit, and you can actually have liquidity every single quarter. We have a redemption that if somebody needs to redeem money out, they can get out up to $100,000. So it serves both accredited and non-accredited investors very well. And um, you know, one of the things I love that you said about ESG, um, I think it's an outstanding thing, except for that people have abused it. They've, we've used the term uh, impact investing. Uh, we took 
we couldn't find anybody that could identify what a real impact investment was. And most of them are concessionary. In other words, when you go to invest and really want to make an impact, you're going to make like three to five or 6%. Mm -hmm. We believe that this can be com commercially motivated and community inspired. And one of my personal beliefs as a conscious capitalist is that we got to make money to give it away. We got to, sustainability is being able to make sure the project continues going and you can keep giving. That's why you build a donor advised fund and you keep it making money so it can make money to give money away. Uh, one of the things we went to early on was many of the foundations around Atlanta and said, hey, this is a great investment. If we can make double digits and we made, you know, this fund made 16% in 2022, we're on track to make 14 probably this year. Those are good numbers really good returns combining the dividends and the net asset value growth. Um, okay. Why not have your donor advised funds invest? Oh, well, you're not big enough. You're not this, you're not that. Um, well, we did just break into one of the biggest foundations in Atlanta, the Jewish foundation, where they have allowed their donor advised funds to be invested because they went through meticulously how we set it up, what the structure is. And then when they realized that these residents literally have $2,800 to $3,000 in savings in less than two years. There's a real impact. Now we can measure impact. Uh, now we got the affordable housing fund in Atlanta talking about hopefully lending us money at lower at lower interest rates. And we showed them that if they could loan us money at 5% instead of the seven we can buy, you know, get it out in the market, we would give them the portfolio and lower the rent cost and increase the rebates to the residents. So what I didn't say is if, if they do live in it like they own it, mm -hmm. at the end of each quarter, they get our average is $150 rental rebate that goes back into their wealth account. Okay. If they do it for a year at 600 bucks. And if they do it all four quarters, they get an extra two, so that's 800. And that's how we build that wealth. They start with 1400 bucks. They got 800 more at the end of the year, it's 2200. And the lift, put them at 23, 24 and do it again year after year. There's real wealth that can be built there. Yeah, at at, at some sort of scale as you yeah, as your organization grows. Um, did you so you got the reg A done? You said people told you not to do it. It's going to be a lot of hard work. You figured out the the regulation A. So then when someone comes in, they um, are they paying? Uh, uh, so they're they're paying fourteen hundred dollars though into the fund or instead of a rental deposit. Instead of the rental, they never buy. expected to get back anyway. I mean, we really got laughed at by some people who said, I don't care where you put it, I've never gotten it back anyway. We go, fine. 90 days from now, you'll see it grow by $150 and see what happens. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the light comes on. They have an electronic dashboard. Our software shows them exactly what grew, shows them uh, what the distribution was for the quarter, which is averaged between five and 6% annually. And so they see their money grow. And then they, we also are constantly in touch with the residents, constantly reminding them that this money you're putting in is yours. Take care of the property because anything you damage will go against that money, just like it would have any other security deposit. But so far we've had two people leave with nothing and everyone else leave with more than they came. Not that we have a lot of turnover. We have, well, renewal rates are over 72%, which is compared to 55 or 56% um, in typical property. So we're getting better renewal rates. People are staying longer. The cost to turn the property is lower, which is good because our average cost used to be 3,600. It's down to about $1,153 because they're taking care of the property. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we keep them very, very engaged. And, and the whole drive behind it is to make sure that there really is a wealth building experience. No, that that's brilliant. I really like it. Um, and this is so far, anyhow, all Atlanta area. Is that right? Yeah. So you said something a minute ago. I think this is going to touch on where you were going, which is right now, you know, in all of Atlanta, as we do this, so we get 300 or 500 or even a thousand residents participating in how much impact did we really make? So what we've been doing is as we built our front end software, which is the Invest With Roots website, where anyone can go on and invest $100 or $100,000 literally in less than four minutes. Um, that website and that software is built around building a larger platform and the ability to deliver living it like you own it across other property owners' properties nationally. 
So our vision is to touch a million residents at, at some point down somewhere around 2028. And that is to, you know, all of the multifamilies are, and even the communities are building in amenities to make people want to rent from them and, and build this relationship as, as they overbuild, which they are at the moment, especially in class A, but as they overbuild, um, the new amenity will be the old one, which is how about a month free if you sign for 12 months or yeah. two months free if you sign for 18. Well, what we say to people is if you sign, if you give a month away, did you engage the resident anymore? Did you improve their lives anymore? Did you do anything for them? And if that rent was say 1700 bucks, what if you just built that in as the rebate that you want to give back to them if they just live in it like they own it and let them not only make that money, but build wealth off of that money. And we're in the very early stages of that. Uh, we aren't even sure what we're going to call it yet, Ryan, but um, we've got the capital starting to be raised and we're excited about that because we know that uh, there are 66 million residents out in, in this country who some of them have money to invest and some of them don't have any way of investing and we can be the same thing to both another place to build wealth and and, and bridge the wealth gap you know i mean esg as a term is important using it appropriately and not calling everything that I mean, there's some groups out there that called it ESG and then continued to raise their rents during the pandemic when they didn't have any increase in expenses. So that wasn't inflation, it was greedflation. Yeah, yeah, and that's not much of a social consideration. Um, yeah. So to your point from the scale side, so so you're you're essentially, if, if we suggested something like Robinhood utilized latest greatest laws to provide access to the equities market that's great um and like you said should we be if, if you're not up to speed how much of that should you be doing is one thing and so now that's what you've done with roots is that with this private reit i can i can actually people anybody can get into a reit because the minimums are so low and the accredited investor thing is not a requirement so I don't have to live in one of these places to just invest in. So now I'm investing in real estate um, without having to like you could, my own houses or anything. I'm just investing in a real. Yeah, you could you could be a, a fifteen hundred dollar renter in Chattanooga, in Oklahoma, in Arkansas, and well, there are no fifteen hundred dollar renters in California, but anywhere anywhere you are. And you can say, look, I got a couple hundred bucks I could put into this thing. And then the, so the software actually builds, we, we're teaching. We're, our whole point is to help people level up in education for finance as well. And we're teaching, you know, what Warren Buffett has taught for years, which is the exponential value of letting things grow over a period of time. So if you put a couple hundred bucks in and then you turn on our recurring investing, okay, then you could put 25, 50 or hundred dollars every month or every quarter you set it up and you can turn it off whenever you want and literally let that money build automatically and invest automatically over over eight and a half percent of our people are now recurring already um you know we're seeing about three to four hundred visitors to the website a day we're seeing about 45 investors a day at this particular point and they'll be under five thousand dollar investors will average somewhere around 800 bucks probably median wow. somewhere around 250 right so that's okay that's what we want i had somebody say to me the, uh, just recently well how are how are you going to service a hundred dollar investor you, you lose money just reporting to the sec right and i said well yeah when they first invest but a year later when they got six hundred dollars in there it's a little bit better and then a year after that when they got twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars in there it's fine it costs the same for that hundred dollar person as a sixteen hundred dollar person. So sometimes you got to have your ver vision bigger than the moment in front of us. Sure. And and we're we're as happy to get a hundred dollar investor as we are to get you know well that's not true. We're happy to get a hundred thousand dollar investor because sure. it helps us go get more property to help more people. But an investor's investor. We've got over fifteen thousand people on this platform now who have come in and who have shown interest and who are engaged. We have over 1500 investors already in the program is there any regulation that makes it easier for you to do that reporting and brings those costs down like that sec stuff or is it still doesn't 
matter. It's, well, it's actually the regulation that makes it more expensive. And yeah. so, um, you know, one of the things they knew was going to happen, and I had both our accountants and having been through equity and publicly held companies and all that stuff before, all of the advisors who I reached out to said, just just figure another way to get them money, Larry. Do not do this Reg A thing. The, the cap table, the, the thing that lists out the, the mm -hmm. investors, right? Well, think of it this way. I put my first investment in $100. Uh, a quarter later, I got my dividend. And I rolled it back in, and and because of the, our structure, we let people roll their dividend at the previous quarter's net asset value. So when we went to 108, I rolled at 100, as did everybody else. Last quarter, when we were at 120, and the 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 dividend came, I rolled in at 120 instead of 124, what it went up to. That means that I now have eight different levels of investment. The cap table looks like a spider web, and we have software. And we know how to manage that cap table. But here's the deal. Because you're Regulation A and, com and compliant to the SEC, which I really like because we can say it, right? And that's important. We have to have a registered agent who charges a fortune to do what we're doing. Mm. And all we do is upload them a file, quite frankly, because we don't want them to come in and get, we want to send them the file and let them verify it and then be the registered agent. Great. This costs us probably a quarter million dollars a year. Mm. but you know what that's part of building something and and you know we have we have a vision for profitability and impact and they, they have to go hand in hand because you cannot have big impact without profit because people won't play and they won't invest yeah i agree i've thought about that a lot i've uh obviously there's a lot of wonderful not for profits in that but um you know getting grant money and figuring things out I, i'm which is wonderful. I'm glad all, all those organizations are doing their things. But for me, I've always tended to, to still say that we can be an impact firm that creates a sustainable cycle within, you know, the capitalistic economy that we live in. Let's make money and be inf impactful. Obviously you get challenged. It's, you still get challenged. Well, if you're making any money, you know, it kind of, are you really doing as much as you can? But, um, I, but I tend yeah. to agree. That's the sustainable model I would, i'll be on any panel anytime and argue with anybody who wants to discuss whether how long can you give money away that you don't make any and we'll see we'll see when we get to the logic stream how many people agree with with each of the two forms of thought but in my and like you said in our opinion in my opinion we can do so much more so if i have a donor advised fund at the community foundation atlanta georgia or anywhere else and i put I give away 200 grand into that advised fund and it makes 4% a year. How much money do I have to give away? Mm -hmm. But if that, that, that fund makes 14% a year, how much money do I have to give away? Sure. Significantly more three, three X more actually over a period of time. So um, I, I do believe that we have to generate sustainable processes. I mean, look, hope through soap is not sustainable if wealthy people or anybody doesn't give them money. Right. Because like that I would, you know, raises a lot of money. But if it weren't for 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 Alex's passion and going out and speaking and doing four TED talks, putting himself out there, it wouldn't make it. Uh, Roots is going to make impact on every single person who invests and every single person who lives with it, and that's what our objective was. Yeah, yeah, and again, both should exist. But uh, my my interest, like yours, I think, is in in the profitable approach that, um, that can keep on giving. Um, and rumor is you're nominated for the ivory prize or you won the ivory prize. Yeah, or we, actually finished, we finished top 25 for the ivory innovation prize, uh, a really cool prize. Um, we did not get into the top 10 and you know, there's not really, they, we didn't ask why and they don't explain why they just, they had, a, I think like, if I remember right, hundreds and hundreds of nominations are put in. And then they go through and they really went through a rigorous process. So we are considered a winner and they actually are applying resources to us cool. to help us continue our business and to do other things. Um, we're a little different than most of the folks that they end up with because a lot of them are pure nonprofits. You know, and in our particular case, we have no intention of being a pure nonprofit. Now we do have a 501c3, by the way. And that 501c3 is there to give rental and community assistance to our residents when they end up in a situation in their lives, which was not something they caused themselves. 
So, you know, we, we had a, a woman who's fantastic who was driving Uber, paying $1,200 a week to get the Uber rental from Uber and then making about $1,200 a week. By the time she was through, she's clearing five dollars $600. She gets wrecked by somebody who gets two tickets, not her, totals the car, calls us up, says, we can't, I can't pay rent. We're, we're done. We're, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just telling you, I'm not going to be able to pay rent this month. And um, we all got together and, you know, one solution would be just pay her rent. That's a Band-Aid because, you know, when I looked at it, I'm pretty sure that she's not going to get a car for quite a while from from the Uber folks and Lyft won't give her one as long as she doesn't have one from them. So instead, what we did is uh, we asked her what all her skill sets were and we found her a job. The job gave her a car, but we also paid three months rent for her out of the nonprofit, not out of Roots because Roots needs to make a profit. So. Sure. We, you know, we, we have had several really gracious donors into the nonprofit who are in, investors. Uh, our team has put money in there. We do a big golf tournament, raise thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, and so we separate pure yeah. charity, and we we like to say that Roots is a hand up, not a hands out. Okay. We're, we're giving people a hand up. We want to help them level up and really get get an opportunity in life. Got it. So you know, by collaborating with the five hundred one C or 503, 501? 501 yep. C3. It's a, a charity 501, yeah. that you can that when people donate, they can actually take a write off it. Got it. So by collaborating with that organization, you're maintaining the integrity of of the the roots uh operating methodology, you know, by partnering with that particular one amongst, you know, who knows others. Got it. Very cool. Um one thing you said that I wanted to just dig into or learn from a little bit, just from the very beginning. Uh, you talked about the concept of uh, up, you know, down, up management. And it's interesting because I've spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out how to do an org chart differently. Like literally, like as one of the steps, like how do you do it? You do pods or squads or do, do you, can you make it super flat? At the end of the day, I, I have yet to successfully articulate a way like I always comes back to, well, Someone has to be responsible and that responsible person has to have a team. And then that, so I don't know, I've, I've struggled to come up with anything clever. So I like what you said. I'm going to think about that. So it's called Noted. an inverted, inverted org chart. And to the best of my knowledge, I did not, I couldn't ever figure out where, where I got the thought process from 37, almost 39 years ago now. And um, I think it might've come from Costco, Ryan. I, I know that they run an inverted org and I started, this is, actually silly my human resources people absolutely told me there was nowhere to find an inverted org chart i said that's fine just build it on powerpoint then i don't care but we are not showing an org chart with me at the top of it it's not going to happen turn it upside down and so we built that literally from when we were eight people till we were 500 and something people and i don't have a problem with depth i don't like pin layers in an org chart i don't have a problem with depth people have to take on certain responsibilities but the philosophy behind is is to that if People on the top of org charts historically look down on people. Let, just think about it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to push this down through the organization. I mean, it, it literally makes my skin crawl when I hear it now. It's been so long. So we said, okay, your job is to not be the boss of, but to support the people above you with the information, materials, education, and empowerment to do their job. Now, Yes, they report to you. That's not a bad term. That's not a bad term. But when we do, we don't do reviews. We do quarterly conversations. And when we have a conversation, it's two ways. The person talks about how they feel they've achieved for the quarter. And then we give them feedback on that. And then they also get to tell us how they thought they were led during the quarter. Did they get the support they needed? Did they get all the materials they needed? Um, it's 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 a really lovely way to run an organization, I got to tell you. And, and it... It made all the difference. We had a 94% employee engagement score at Easy Care at Apco and Easy Care when I was there. Um, some things did change, and I think it's dropped considerably. And now they got a new guy who I like a lot, and I think he's going to bring it back up. But it um, it's just a totally mental flip. Yep. Yeah, the uh, philosophical point of view drives the kind of behavior and conversation. I mean, yes, yeah, so technically, technically, you're going like this. But what does it do? I totally believe and see how it can you know, changes the point of view and the conversation. I mean, basically consider it done as far as I'm concerned, as far as what I got, I'm going to do tomorrow 
is figuring out how to I'll tell, you get, I'll tell you where to get the org chart too literally within two weeks of, of, of retiring i'm like okay where'd you find this i finally had time to breathe right my, my, my calendar looked empty so i start looking up inverted org charts inverted organizations i found it in like 10 minutes i found the <laughs> software for it i found everything yeah I, I was pretty confident i'm sure you know back when you, were, you started doing it but i'm pretty sure i can find it right now um, I imagine the tool I use is probably I'll one of the I'll send yeah. it to you. <laughs> That's great. And then the kind of the, the last thing I wanted to ask you, um, you know, in a similar vein, I saw just from the company's website from Roots, uh, it had you listed as culture cultivator, building a team that is totally aligned on core values. So uh, I imagine some of that experience that you just described is, you know, how you came up with that creative role. Yeah, they wrote the, the, the guys wrote that. Um, I, when they came to me, I said, I will not play CEO on this. I've done it already. And I really wanted to um, see Daniel and Scott, Scott, who's the chief operating officer. Um, final decisions always got to go to somebody. If you have nobody, if you don't have at least one person in charge, nobody's in charge. And so everyone should be open to listening and hearing, but one person has to make that final decision when it comes down to it. And that is Daniel. We all agreed to that, but I told them that I, I don't want a title and I don't, you know, and I'm working, trust me, I'm working 10, 12 hours a day really right now, but I don't consider it work. It's just so much fun doing what we're doing. Um, the idea, I, I think every organization is, the only reason they succeed is because of culture and the people. The, 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 the people are the organization. I mean, it's the art, articles of incorporation don't do anything. <laughs> Core values on a on a on a sheet of paper don't mean anything unless people understand what they say and live by them. So there, our core values are on our website, but they're also on everybody's desk, and they're also out every quarter in our quarterly conversation as we discuss how well did we tie to our core values. So uh, the thing I you know everybody's got a little piece of magic or something they do well. I, I feel like for me it's it's really making sure that everyone's aligned along the same uh tr track treating each other in a kind of respectful way that makes it fun to go up and go to work in the morning you know simon Sinek has a great ted talk and a book called start with why and and another one called leaders eat last and i'm a big fan of simon's because he he really outlines that you have to feel great about the person on your left and the person on your right and you've got to have a family working together towards an, an end and that that end and that cause had better be bigger than the money you think you're making or you will not get there wow have you written your book yet or what <laughs> that's funny because i've written many little segments of vignettes um and i'm pretty sure my book would be about 19 pages because i think all of them are too damn long um and it would be called it's it's more personal it's not just business it's more personal than that um i don't think there's a line between business and personal i think you cannot separate them so um, will I write a book? No, I've been approached by people to ghost them for me. And I don't think I got enough words to film one of those things. I don't care if they sell or not. I just would love to, every single thing you've heard from me today is stolen from somebody else anyway. And so, um, there's plenty of resources out there. Yeah. Um, well, that's great. I really, uh, think it's cool what you and the team are, or Daniel and, and the rest of the team are doing there at Roots and appreciate you sharing it. Um, before we wrap, one quick little game we like to play, a fan favorite. Uh, add a little, little bit of comedy, but I, I usually connect it to something meaningful. So I'm going to ask you, it's a 50-50 choice. It's beans or barley, okay? So they, that's either the core product of what of what this organization that I'm going to say, they're, which one of those are they using? Um, we'll see if you get it. All you got to do is say either beans or barley. And the company is Firelight. barley <laughs> nope they are beans they uh they are in atlanta and i will read you read you their pitch because i thought it was cool um they focus on sourcing the best and most interesting coffees that push the boundaries of environmental economic social sustainability they focus on the farmer's well-being caring for the coffee farmland and they incentivize the coffee producers to create sustainable operations so i thought you might catch it there in your backyard uh somewhere i love but, it i love it Firelight. Yeah, yeah I, light. Love, I love coffee, so I'll be checking them out. Gosh, I love coffee too. It's so good. <laughs> um, well, um, thanks again, Larry. Uh, this has been another episode of the ESG Experience podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. 
you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. There's a new episode every month. Thanks to our loyal subscribers for continuing support. If you want to continue the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. And one more time, I just want to say thank you very much, Larry, for your time. And I really appreciate the experience and the stories that you shared with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having us on. I really do appreciate it.